الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد Welcome all of you uh, tonight inshallah we're going to talk about uh, a, a topic that may not be uh, common and that is uh, the topic of meditation Anyone knows what that means even? Have you heard of the term? Have you heard of the term? Have you heard of the word? So I see some yoga. Uh, uh, so uh, meditation, a lot of people don't realize that in Islam, we do have meditation. And uh, meditation in Islam is not necessarily like meditation you see in other traditions. Now that doesn't mean that meditation in other traditions is no good. Uh, a lot of it is based on human experience. So some people go into seclusion for years and they come to some, uh, uh, I don't know, discoveries or, or whatever. So in Islam, uh, we have what we call guided meditation. We have guidance in the Quran and the Sunnah about how to do it uh, properly. Um, but before that, some people might say, well, why even bother? Why should I care? Especially for young people. Like, I mean, meditation, if anything, it's for adults or old people. Why should I care? And one big reason why everybody should care is because uh, nowadays we deal with lots of issues, a lot of mental issues. I mean, people, young people going through anxiety and panic attacks and depression, uh, it's no longer the case that only adults face difficulties in life, face, you know, stress and, and uh, a lot of work. A lot of people go through schools that are really difficult, really hard. You have lots of homework, you have lots of assignments, and you have to do uh, lots of other stuff. So, as a result, you, you have cases where you have very young people going through, uh, like I said, uh, episodes of anxiety and panic and all of that. And meditation will, will give you that cooling effect, if you will. And it will give you a break from the pressure of life. At the end, what you want to happen is that you want to accomplish this tranquility, this tumatnina in Arabic we call it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Quran that if you, if you are able to mention God properly, you're going to arrive to that peaceful state. Now, the question is, well, how do I get there? In other traditions, there is a, a lot of interest in sitting down, maybe in a dark room, maybe closing your eyes, and trying to stop your train of thought, because you are bombarded by thoughts every second. And those thoughts distract you. And they, they in fact, uh, prevent you from having a good time. And in fact, they bring, a lot of times, they bring sorrow to your life. They bring sadness to your life. And you ruminate, and you keep doing that. So it, it kind of spoils the fun. And you, it, it deprives you from living in the present moment. So a lot of uh, meditation practices, their aim is to allow you to enjoy the present moment as much as possible. Now the question is, is that an aim in Islam? Is that what Islam wants you to do? To be able to enjoy the present? Well, that's one aim. But it's much more. Basically, in Islam, there's like three or four steps. To make it very simple. The first step is to open your eyes. Not to close them, but to open them. And you see tons of verses in the Quran that talk about nawar that you open your eyes and look around you. <coughs> that is the first step. Uh, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, <laughs> Have they not looked around them in the kingdom of the heavens and earth? Very simple, just go outside. I mean, I know some people now stare at screens for hours, non-end, playing games, uh, being on social media, you know, uh, Snapchatting or, uh, you know, uh, going on Twitter or Facebook. And you spend hours and hours staring at a screen. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, go outside, 
and stare at the skies. Literally, like you go outside and stare at the skies. And you have no idea how much relieving that is. And now they tell you, I mean, if, you, if your eyes are hurting from uh, staring at a computer for too long, the best cure is to go outside and look at the skies. Look at the blueness, the, that blue color. And that gives you, because we're made to look at nature. We're not made to look at computers and tablets and phones. And you see this over and over again. For example, in one verse, not only that you look at the sky and that's it, you look in the details, matter, like what's in it. So look at the sky, you, look, you can look at planets and stars. I mean, maybe you could learn how to tell the difference. I mean, how can you tell the difference between a planet and a star? Stars blink. Yes, the stars blink and the planets do not. So it's really, if you train your eye, you can easily tell the difference between a planet and a star. So we say twinkling, right? The twinkling of a star. The planet does not. Yes, sir? Planets are bigger. And they are bigger, yes. So immediately after sunset, you can, you can see Venus right away. Venus is so easy to tell. The sun, you said? Yeah, but don't stare at the sun. Uh, but we're talking about planets. Uh, so we have Venus, you can see easily, you can see... Uh, what other planets can you see? Jupiter. Yeah, Jupiter is so easy to spot. You don't need any telescope. What else? I have a question. So you said that the blueness of the sky is like the blueness of the planets. Does it count if you like look at a picture of the sky through a screen? It's not as good. No, 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 no. Don't fool yourself. You don't look at a screen that has some nature. Yeah, it might have some cooling effect. It's much, much better to go outside and look at the actual sky. If you, if you got the chance to look at something real, why do you want to look at something fake? <coughs> okay. You guys go there. Another, another verse says, not only that you look at it, he said, get out and travel. He says, قُلْ سِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Go and walk on earth. The two verses actually. One of them says, like, go out and look around you and explore. I mean, in fact, this verse, if you, if, you, if you think about it carefully, it says, this is one way to discover how life began on earth. Because it says, how life started on earth. You don't find this in any other religion. The other religions were trying to hide this. They said you cannot go and explore because you might find something that is contradictory to religion. Islam from the beginning says there's nothing to be afraid of. Go outside and look and learn, observe, take notes and learn how it all started because there is no contradiction between revelation, true revelation and nature. But a lot of people think there's a difference. They call it, you know, they say this is a natural religion. And then there is re revealed or the revealed religion. In Islam, we don't distinguish. We say Islam is Deen al-Fitrah. Islam is a religion of nature. Our nature, everybody's nature. So this is important. So we have this call over and over again in the Quran, this call to look and use your senses. I mean, think of your eyes as sensors, your ears. It, all the senses, in fact, even the smell and the, and the taste, all of that and the touch, all of these are sensors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. And this is the first step in meditation. This is the input. This is how you get the input from nature around you. So that is uh, step number one. Step number two is tafakkur. A lot of times when we talk about meditation, uh, 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 people think of Tafakkur and Tadabbur. If you want to translate uh, meditation in, in the Quranic language, it is mostly those two things, Tafakkur and Tadabbur. Right? Um, so Tafakkur is basically to reflect and to ponder and to contemplate and to think and to think deeply about something. So that is the second step where you process the information. 
So the first one is you sense it, and the second one is you process it, you analyze it. Like you, you look at the heavens, you don't just look at it and say, ah, uh, it's not a big deal, it's kind of dumb, let me go back to my game. No, you, in fact, you, you, uh, you're able to, to um, take some meaning out of it, to make something out of it. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that this is one of the goals. He said, They think, they ponder, they reflect upon the creation of the heavens and earth. And then they come to the conclusion, رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلًا سُبْحَانًا what, what are you doing there? Taking notes as a group. As a group? That's not a good idea. Don't you have like... Uh, I know you have multiple pens, but you need multiple notebooks. Okay. Anyway, you can do that, but don't make a lot of noise. It's good to collaborate, don't be wrong. Just don't make a lot of noise. Thank you. What was I saying? Oh, you're talking about looking at the universe thing. No. Okay. Good. <laughs> what else? What else was I talking about? That's the last thing I remember. That's the last thing That is the last thing I said. Okay, good. Yes, that's exactly the last thing I said. Excellent. Good job. Now, this guy was listening. The reason we say that is because nowadays, a lot of people, they say, well, uh, science is separate from religion, right? And science, science is all that matters. And science is all about the how. It's not about the why. There's no way we can learn or tell what the why is, why the universe was created. The only thing we can do is study how the universe came about. <coughs> and what happens when you do that, you're going to end up with a life without any meaning, which we call nihilism. Nihilism is a big word. All it means is that you live a life with no meaning whatsoever. But look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said the opposite. After you do this pondering and reflection and meditation, what happens? رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلَا you come to the conclusion that this universe was not created in vain. There is a meaning, there is a meaning behind it. So that is super important. And I'm sure all of that makes sense to you. Does that sound too philosophical? Mm -hmm. Too difficult to process? There's a meaning behind everything. Yes, and in fact, when you look at the, you know, at least Maybe there's no meaning behind some, some of our actions. Some, some of our actions are in vain. We do them uh, for, for no good reason. But the actions of Allah, all of them, has a purpose, has a meaning. Okay, so that is the second step, which is the step of reflection, contemplation, thinking, uh, pondering, Meditation, we could say. Now, there is a third step. A lot of people stop there. And they say, okay, great. I'm able to, you know, look and reflect. And I'm, I feel now so sophisticated. I'm, I'm so deep in thought. And they stop there. But in Islam, there is a third step, which is action. And action sometimes could be on the tongue. You say dhikr. You mention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I know a lot of people, they just learn in school, in Sunday school or Islamic school, that you have to remember a lot of dhikr. So they teach you a lot of dua, they teach you a lot of, you know, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, all of that good stuff. But here what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, if you do that after this process, like you're looking around, you, you may, uh, like you look at, you know, you go camping for example, you look at the mountains and the rivers and the trees and you muse at it, like, you enjoy it. The outcome of that is that you start mentioning Allah. You say, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah. You, you are at awe. And, and, and that kind of makes you say that. It's an expression of your feeling. So that is the third step, which is uh, when you mention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then finally, like I said, when you do all of this, you're going to feel some peace and some serenity and tranquility in the heart. 
So if, you have, if your heart is racing because you have so much work and you are under a lot of pressure, this is definitely a way to reduce the anxiety and the, the panic and you know, the pressure. Okay, so now we're gonna tell a little story. And that is about uh, Prophet Muhammad So it's not just that the Quran said that or that, you know, it's, you know, all over the Quran, if you look for the word, يتفكرون, you see many, many examples of that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inviting us to think all the time, to reflect, to contemplate, to ponder all the time. But it was also the practice of the Prophet, peace be upon him, even before he was a Prophet. So let us uh, listen to the story. So Aisha, the, uh, the, uh, the wife of the Prophet, or the Prophet's wife, now reads, it says that the first thing that came to the Prophet, I mean, so he was like 40 years old, right? And before he became a Prophet, something started to happen, which is that he started seeing dreams, and those dreams come true. We call it vision. When you see a vision, it means it comes true. It's not like your own imagination or, uh, you know, from shaitan. It is rather from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first thing that the Prophet was encountered, uh, or he encountered, was the fact that he would see a dream and it comes true. And then came a period where he went into seclusion. So this is a prophet, around 40 years old. He went into this period of seclusion. He would go, uh, uh, he would walk all the way to the cave of Hira. Uh, how many of you have been to Mecca? Just one or two? That's it. So inshallah, all of you will make it there one, one day. And if, I don't know if you, uh, so the Ghar of Hira is not very close to the Kaaba, but if they took you on a tour, like some uh, really good uh, packages, they will <laughs> take you around. And if you've, see, if you've seen the, the cave of Hira, I mean, you don't have to go there. It's a really rough climb, in fact. But even if you, if you see it from the highway or from the road, you see it's really high. And the Prophet ﷺ used to hike all the way up every few days. The Prophet was very fit, by the way. He was not obese like many of us. He was very fit. So he used to walk, he used to hike every few days all the way up to the cave of, <coughs> what cave? Hira. Can you say it? Hira. <laughs> Come on, you have to know the Arabic. Hira, what is Hira? Hira is Hura, Hura is vanity, vain. Hira. Yes, good. I don't care if your parents are Arab or not. If you're a Muslim, you are, you, your tongue is Arabic. So Hira. All right? Okay. So it says, فَكَانَ يَخْلُوا بِغَارِ حِرَاءٍ فَيَتَحَنَّتُ فِيهِ He would go into seclusion. So he would spend the night by himself, all by himself. And uh, inside the cave, uh, it's also very, uh, like in, in some, at least in some areas, it's very narrow. But the scene from up there is beautiful. You see all of Mecca. So he would spend uh, days and nights worshiping God the way he knows it. At the time, there was no prayer, there was no salat. I mean, he was not a prophet yet. But he would try his best. And then when his provision runs out, so he would take provision like food and water. And once that provision runs out, he goes back to his wife Khadija. So he would do that every few days. So you can imagine the majority of his time in the cave, what is he doing? Praying, worship, meditation. Meditation. That, that is a topic, so we have to remember this word, meditation. He is contemplating, he was musing at the universe, at the heavens and earth. He was making tafakkur and tadabbur, reflection. So these words will be on the quiz, you have to remember them. Tafakkur and tadabbur. What is tafakkur? Thinking. Thinking, reflection. What is tadabbur? Preparing. What is it? 
preparing? No. Tadabur. No. That is the tadrib. Maybe you think it of tadabur. Oh, oh. Yeah, that's different. Tadabur. Oh, tadabur. Oh. Not tadbir even. Tadabur. Tadbir is to plot and plan. Tadrib is practice. It's a new word. Forget about the other words, tadbir and tadrib. Tadabur is to contemplate. The dead word is to contemplate and to ponder. So these words are essential, you have to remember that. Okay, so he would do that every few nights. Until one day the truth came to him. And it was actually Angel Jibreel. So Jibreel came to the Prophet while he was in that state in the cave of Hira. And we know the story, right? When Jibreel asked the Prophet, read, and the Prophet would say, I do not read. Yes? Um, why would the Prophet <laughs> go to the cave? For what, why would he meditate? For what hmm. So the question is, why would the Prophet <laughs> go to the cave to meditate? It, it is not really clear the actual reason. It couldn't a, an inspiration by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go there because obviously this is how he met Jibreel. If he did not go there, he would not, he would not have met Jibreel salam. So it could have been an inspiration. Just like, for example, the Prophet never worshipped an idol. You say, well, how is that? Why is that so? I mean, he was around his people and all of his people, all of his tribe worshipped idols. <coughs> But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would, would make it happen so that he does not worship any idol. So if he was invited to a party when there's lots of like drinking and womanizing and, uh, and calling uh, and worshiping idols, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would prevent the Prophet from going there. So you can call it a divine uh, protection, if you will. The Prophet ﷺ was guarded from the beginning. Even before he was a prophet, he was guarded, he was in fact prepared to become a prophet. And you can think of this as a form of preparation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was preparing the prophet to become one when he inspired him to go to the cave of Hira. Because again, this is one form of preparation. You need to have a clear mind. You cannot be busy with other people going into business and going to the markets. You need to clear up your mind to be ready for such a heavy duty, heavy, uh, you know, uh, uh, task. Allah knows best. Good question. Did you all hear the answer? Because I know some of you were talking. Uh, we, shall, I, we shall all add it to the quiz. It's a good question. Oh, now we have the prizes. Actually, a brother gave me a, a pillow. I'm not sure what to do with it, but I'll borrow it. I know if I rest on it, I'll fall asleep. You want, you want it? But don't fall asleep. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so when Jibreel came to the Prophet uh, the Prophet uh, responded that he, he could not read and then we know the beginning of Surah Al-Aq was revealed Iqra' bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq You all know the Surah, I hope And then the Prophet rushed back to Khadija and he was scared because of this first encounter <coughs> So at that time he wasn't exactly sure what's happening to him until he was reassured later that this is a revelation and you, you are becoming a prophet. And he went to Khadija, and that shows the, uh, the transparency and the honesty of the Prophet He was not like, nowadays, you know, we all play macho, like, oh, I'm not afraid, I'm not scared. And like you're shivering inside. The Prophet was not like that. He was a simple man and he was honest. He went to his wife and said, you know, I'm scared. And he said, I'm, I'm cold. I need, I need some blankets. Wrap me. Zamiluni means, can you wrap me with some blankets? That's the meaning of Zamiluni. And we have Surah Al-Muzammil because of that. 
يا ايها المزمل so uh, you know he was wrapped until that fear kind of faded away حتى ذهب عنه الروع like the fear kind of vanished and faded away anyway that is a long story but the point is we see that the prophet ﷺ was spending a lot of time in, in meditation and that he was in seclusion and you know this is not to say that uh, this only happened in the beginning of islam we should not do it anymore in fact we are recommended to look around like i said in the beginning look at nature and there are some hadith that says that in some times it's better to seclusion. But usually the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is that it is better to stay with people and don't become a hermit, don't become a monk. In Islam we don't have monkship, uh, right? Uh, you don't just go and, you know, you go to some monastery and you never get married. We don't have that in Islam. But in some cases, if there's lots and lots and lots of corruption, we are guided to stay away from the corruption. If you can face it and fix it, that's even better. And the Prophet ﷺ told us, just give me a second, I don't want you to hold your hand too, too long. He told us, The one who is able to intermingle, interact with people, and he's patient with their harm. Because anytime you interact with people, they're going to harm you, one way or another. They're going to say a word that you don't like, they're going to insult you in some cases, they're gonna, they might even push you around. But if you are patient, this is better than the people who cannot take it. Some people cannot take anything. They're so sensitive. And they cannot uh, be social. That's why we have anti-social people now. Right? So it is better. If you can do it, it's much better. So that is the Islamic summary of uh, you know, how we interact with others. And that it is, it is better in general. But you also need time for yourself. Okay. Okay, so maybe this is a good time for a summary. So the question is, how do we med meditate? So let me repeat the three steps. So I mentioned three steps. And if you did not get anything so far, listen up. This is the summary. This is the most important part. How do we meditate Islamically? I'm, I'm just giving you the very, very, like, uh, introduction to meditation because we're not going to go into a lot of details. The first step is you open up your eyes and you examine everything around you and you try and see uh, lessons around you. So this is the first step. You examine the universe. You look at the sky, the trees, the birds and you ponder and think about that. The second step is to think and ponder about that. It means also that you learn about it. So it's totally fine if you learn, like, science is a very good example, that you, you study the universe. That is part of the second step, which is contemplation and reflection. So you learn about light and what's made, what, what's made of. You learn about, you know, the animal kingdom. There's a lot to be learned there. So the second step is the reflection, the thinking, the pondering. And the third one is when you say, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, you make dhikr. Uh, so as a result, you say, like if you, say, you see something very majestic, very beautiful, you say SubhanAllah. So that is the third step. So that's very brief. Yes? You can say also MashaAllah. Very good. So yes. where is the meditation? Where is the meditation? meditation is all of it. Yes. Yeah. But the middle is the most, like if you, if you strictly say meditation is tadabbur and tafakkur, then it becomes the second step. So think of it as three steps. The first one is input. You're sensing uh, nature and uh, things around you. By the way, it is not limited to nature. You can, for example, look at the Quran and you make reflection on the verses. You, you can look at your own life. Allah subhanahu wa told us, وَفِي أَنفُسِكُمْ أَفَلَا تُبْسِرُونَ It's also in you, all these miracles inside you, in your body. You can also examine your life, what have you done so far? Uh, that is also part of uh, your reflection. So, uh, 
Again, three steps. The first one is the input. The second one is the processing inside your, your mind, your brain. And the third one is the output. So uh, you say something like SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, you make a dua, all of that. And uh, um, there are other types. For example, you can think about the deeds you've done. Uh, one of the early Muslims, Al Fudayl, he said, turika hasanatika wa He said that uh, reflection and contemplation and meditation is like a mirror. It allows you to see your good deeds and your bad deeds. A lot of people go through life and they never think about what they've done. But if you sit down and think about what you've done, now you can, you can make it better. You can improve. So this is another form where you think about what you've done. Right, Omar? Again, I have a lot of material, but again, because uh, I have a young crowd, I want to make sure it's simple enough. I don't want to go into a lot of details. I think this is good enough for now. If you have any questions, now is the time to ask questions. Oh. Yes. Um, this is like a bit off topic, but um, when you mentioned that the Prophet said that, uh, like going down the mountain, like you know, talking to his wife mm-hmm. and pretending he was a prophet. Um, yeah, like for the for his wife, <coughs> cousin, um, did he ever the one that told him that he was like he was like, um, his prophethood? Uh, did he live until uh, Prophet started like teaching or? Oh, you mean Waraka bin Nufal, yeah. the the cousin of Khadija? Yeah. It doesn't seem that he did, but he said, he said, if I were to live, I would support you. In fact, let me, uh, I think there is a bit of that mentioned in the narration itself. <coughs> so what happened, Khadija took him to uh, her cousin. Her cousin was a Christian, and he was a learned man. So he knew about scripture. That's why Khadija took her to Waraqa bin Nufal. And he used to write Injil in his hand. He used to write the Gospel in his hand. Um, <clears throat> it says, وَكَانَ يَكْتُبُ الْكِتَابَ الْعِبْرَانِي فَيَكْتُبُ مِنَ الْإِنْجِيلِ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ أَنْ يَكْتُبُ He used to write uh, Hebrew. And uh, he would write as much as Allah would allow, allow him to write. And he was an old man, he was blind. He was blind. Uh, Khadija uh, uh, asked Waraka, she said, Oh cousin, oh cuz, as we say today, right? Yes. Ibn Am. Even in Arabic, it says, Ibn Am. He didn't say Ibn Ammi. Like, Ibn Am. It's like cuz. Isma' Ibn Ibn Akhik. Listen up to your uh, nephew. Now, again, uh, he's not a nephew, but, you know, uh, this is just to, uh, uh, you know, show the closeness. فَقَالَ لَهُ وَرَقَ So Waraka said, يَا بْنَ أَخِي مَا ذَا تَرَى فَأَخْبَرَهُ رَسُولَ سَلَمْ خَبَرَ مَا أَرَى So the Prophet told him exactly what happened to him in the cave of Hira. And Waraka told him, هَذَا النَّامُوسِ أَلَّذِي نَزَّلَ اللَّهُ عَلَى مُوسَى This is the same angel that came down to Musa a.s. So immediately Waraka was able to spot or to tell that this man is a genuine prophet. And then look what he said. يَا لَيْتَنِي فِيهَا جَذَعًا لَيْتَنِي أَكُونُ حَيًّا إِذْ يَخُرِجُكَ فَوْمُكَ He said, I wish I would be young, or I wish I were young. I wish I would be alive when your people will cause your exile. <coughs> so he already foretold, he said, your people will kick you out. You're going to be leaving Mecca. They're not going to let you stay in Mecca. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهُ أَوَمْ مُخْرِجِيَهُمْ They're going to exile me? I mean, they're my people, they're my, like, my tribe, my clan. Look what he said. He said, نَعَمْ He said, indeed. لَمْ يَأْتِ رَجْلٌ قَطُّ بِمِثْي مَا جِتَّ بِهِ إِلَّا عُودِي There's no man who came with what you came with, except that he, he, he would be taken as an enemy. He would be taken as an enemy. See, because prophets were not politically correct. They would tell it as is. Their mission is to rectify, to identify problems and solve them. 
and they're not about to beat around the bush or to sugarcoat. They tell us. A lot of times people read the Quran and, and, and they think it's too strong, it's too straightforward. But how else would you fix people? If you beat around the bush too much, they will not understand. So yes, the Quran is strong, it is direct, because it needs to fix our human state. وَإِن يُدْرِكُنِي يَوْمُكَ أَنْصُرُكَ نَصْرَ مُؤَزْرًا If I get the chance to live, I will support you like nothing else. I will support you better than anyone else. But then it says at the end, ثُمَّ لَمْ يَنْشَبْ وَرَقَ أَنْ تُوَفِّي But وَرَقَ died almost immediately after. وَفَتَرَ الْوَحِي So he died even before that law. There was a law. So there was one revelation, which is Al-Alaq, and then, uh, and maybe Al-Muzzammil, a part of Al-Muzzammil, part of Mudathir, and then there was a period of law, meaning there was no revelation. And the Prophet was worried and all of that, and then Surah Al-Duha came down. That's why the Prophet, uh, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Duha, what did he say? مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَمْ Allah did not leave you. Because the, the pagans were saying, Oh, Allah forgot about Muhammad. He doesn't care about Muhammad. So the ayah was revealed. مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى Allah never left you alone. And He did not abandon you. He did not abandon you. But it says that Waraqa died before, even before that law. So he must have died almost immediately after that incident. So yeah, he, he did not live long to, to see the Prophet. As you say. What would, Good question. What would he say? Like, the things he said, would that count as accepting Islam? Inshallah. I mean, uh, he had, had intention and he said, I will uh, support you. <coughs> I mean, his judgment is with Allah, but uh, everything indicates that he was willing to follow the Prophet. He has every intention to do that. So. We a proof that the Prophet even invited him. I mean, it was too early. So, right? So here we see Waraqa assuring the Prophet that he was a Prophet. That's how early it was. So, inshallah, we, we, we think best of these people. Yes? These deep questions. There's so much concern about who's going to be punished, who's not going to be punished. So he said, because he's from Ahlul Kitab, is he going to be punished? So all the people, all, or all of Ahlul Kitab, who believe in Jesus properly, are saved. Especially before Prophet Muhammad We call some of these are called Ahlul Fatra because there was a big law between Jesus and Prophet Muhammad, right? It was like what 600 years? It's a long, long time. But all these people who try their best to follow the truth are saved. And it seems like this man did his best. And like I said, I mean, he recognized the Prophet for being a Prophet. In fact, he's the one who assured him that he is a true Prophet. So obviously, and he said, I will support you if I get to live. But he did not live. So again, we, sit, we think best of these people. Yes. Oh wow, that's a really good question. Are there any people like this now who still believe in the original message of Jesus? That's what she says. Well, there are people, for example, who are Unitarian, and people who, and I've met some people who do not believe in Trinity. These are a minority. But also keep in mind that a lot of people do not know about the true message of Islam. And that is because the true message of Islam never got to them. And you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَمَا كُنَّ مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا We do not punish until we send a prophet. And that means that somebody has to receive the message properly. If you receive a message and it's distorted, it's modified. Like a lot of non-Muslims nowadays, the message of Islam they get is a very distorted message. All they hear about is terrorism and this and that. They don't get the actual message of Islam. So if these people did not get a chance, 
We don't know. On the Day of Judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be the, the, the just one, right? He is, he's not going to treat anyone unjustly, right? right. So in some case, oh, okay. who just woke up? Somebody just woke up. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, so is that clear? So we actually, we have some narrations that on the Day of Judgment, in some cases, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test certain people. So it's still not tested in this life. Like there could be somebody on an island. They never heard of anything. That's possible. I don't know. Let's hypothetically assume there's such a thing. Uh, on the Day of Judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can test them. Uh, also, there's a narration that says they might even uh, receive prophets on the Day of Judgment. The Day of Judgment is too long, like 50,000 years, so it's plenty of time. <coughs> That's the general rule, but like I said, there are some narrations that indicate that if people did not get a chance in this life, they might get another in the next. Allah knows what's Yes? So now I'm sure all the questions will be about that. Can you all play, please listen up? Because somebody's asking. Thank you. Yeah, once, one time we had a halaq about that. I don't know if you were here. Now, those trials are different. So on the Day of Judgment, the, bro the brother said there are uh, various phases. So, for example, people will, will stand and wait. There's one phase, another phase. People will, will, uh, will be invited to drink from a, a big, big lake. And only the people who follow the prophets will drink. Every prophet will have a pond. There will be a step or, or a phase where people will have to go over a, 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 a bridge, a, a long bridge over the hellfire. And only... The people who have good deeds will be able to make it. Uh, so there are many different phases on the Day of Judgment. We talked about them. You can say that those are the trials. But I'm not talking about that. When I say that certain people who did not get a chance to receive a message in this life will be tried on the Day of Judgment, I mean a specific trial. Only if that makes sense. So there's a narration that says Allah will command them to do something. If they do it, they'll pass. For example. Yes. So when you said the how like that bridge but they can Any questions about meditation? <laughs> no. <laughs> Go ahead. Um when you say that like that bridge they'll only be able to cross it, they have good deeds. That that only count they're the the good deeds only count from this like from up until from during their life in the general. It doesn't matter how much they believe at that time. Yes. In general that is true. So, for example, if people were given enough evidence in this life and they do not believe, then of course they're not going to get another chance. I'm saying about that specific group of people who never got the right message or the true message. Those may, may get another chance. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might pardon them because... Or he, he may not. I mean, the thing is, we don't know how much somebody tried to learn the truth. Because that is also a factor. Like... Have you put any effort to learn it or not? Is the first step of big judgment is when you put into your grave and the angel comes down? We should have a, 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 a... Should we vote? Maybe next time we'll do one about the day of judgment. We should refresh our memories. But go ahead. The first step, yes. Some scholars have said that as soon as you die, your day of judgment has started. So yes. You can count as the first step. Uh, how long did it take him to get up to the cave? And like, how did the people of Quraysh feel about it? Like, did people know about it? Pretty much before the Prophet became public with his message, the Prophet was very well, well accepted among Quraysh. They used to love him. You know, they used to call him Al-Sadiq, Al-Ameen, all of that. They used to leave their trust with him. So in general, he was very, he was popular, you can say even. He was well liked, well known and well liked. So that was before the, the uh, you could say it was before he went public with his message. Like, like the people know that he was going to the cave. Oh, yeah, I think, I mean, obviously his wife knew. Uh, now, I, I don't know, may, I may have to look, look it up a bit more to see if anybody was 
spying or spotting and what are we doing? I don't know. It's, it's not clear. But yes, Saad. So you know how you mentioned that the prophets weren't like wishy-washy or like they didn't be around the bush about certain topics, right? So for people who would like get discouraged, for example, if they read something cut off, like the century cut off, right? Mm -hmm. Like there are some people now that would, like if you're like, oh, which ruling is hot off, they get discouraged and might like step away from Islam, not like completely, but like maybe, maybe like stop doing certain things, right? In some cases, isn't it like not better, like, yeah, better to not be like really, really straightforward about it because you might make people like, I don't know. So if it is a sin between you and God, it is better not to disclose it. So this is a, a different situation here. You're talking about somebody who is tested with a sin. You should work on it in private. Because what happens if you start talking about it and you broadcast, some people broadcast their sin, in fact you are encouraging others to do the sin. So it's better to keep it between you and Allah, unless there's somebody who can really help you. But in general, it's better to keep it between you and yourself. Like, don't tell anyone. And work on it and try and fix it and try to get, get, get rid of it. So that's not being wishy-washy. This is what you should do. Because what happens, a lot of people, when they do a sin, they want everybody to do the same sin. They feel guilty. if, And, and they want to uh, involve everybody in that sin. Because they feel better about themselves. So it's better not to announce it. It's better not to... Tell others because it's going to encourage others to, to do the same sin. All right. Any other questions? All clear. Yes. Aside from the the Prophet and the meditation of Islam and the of the Sahaba did. That's a good question. The question is after Islam spread and everything. Uh, do we have anything uh, or any any uh, example or evidence that some Sahaba did some uh, meditation or went into seclusion? We have some examples, like uh, for example, uh, Abu Darda. He would go to a place called Rabda. It's a little far, and he would stay by himself. So there are some examples. Also, we have some, uh, I would say, some uh, hadith. That, like I said, in the future, when corruption is so common, uh, this is a this is a, a possible solution. At least it's, it's an outlet. Let's say it's an outlet for some people. But for example, the Hadith in Bukhari, when the Prophet said, "Yushiku inna khair mali al-Muslim ghanam yatba'u biha sha'af al-jibal yafiru bidinihi min al-fitan." So in this case, he said that it's almost time. When, for some people at least, uh, the best way to make money is to run away from all civilization. I'm not recommending this. I'm just saying this is a narration. <laughs> that in order to, because corruption is all over the place, especially in financial matters. So if you want to keep your money clean, he said, you, you have a herd of sheep and you go in the mountains and you run away from all these tribulations and trials and, and corruption. So we do have some hadith like that. We cannot deny it, it's there. But like I said, if, if there's a way to deal with it and to even fix it and rectify it, right, to protect yourself from it, that is a better solution. If you cannot, uh, that's definitely a, an outlet, like I said. So we cannot stop if people want to do that and if they feel like, I cannot protect myself, I cannot protect my family. Well, it's better to save yourself and your family uh, than saving others in that case. And by the way, this is a, a, a general rule. Even if you decide to stay in the same city, for example, uh, your number one priority is to save yourself and your family before you save others. Yes. I would have expected a narration by our mother Khadija uh -huh. on this event. Uh -huh. and she was very proud of that. Yes. Yes, very good. Uh, so the question is, uh, the brother would have expected a narration from Khadija, uh, not from Aisha. Aisha came later. So by the way, you notice this quite a bit. There are hadith that are narrated from one companion, uh, like it's from one companion to the other. So we have narrations from a, a later companion, 
that heard from an earlier companion. Because this idea of narration was not common in the beginning. This idea of narrating came a bit later. At the very beginning, and Khadija died in Mecca, right? So at that time, the narration of hadith was not common. But this story was transmitted around. Or was it, there was not an actual narrator until we have Aisha to narrate that. Narrate that. So this is in general acceptable, acceptable because all of the Sahaba are adul. All of the companions are trustworthy. So if Ibn Abbas narrated, say, from Ibn from Umar, not Ibn, if Ibn Abbas narrated from Umar, that's totally valid. And even if it is, is not mentioned, because all of the companions are trustworthy, even if there's like three Sahaba involved in the narration, like one from the other from the other, if the middle companion is not mentioned, is dropped, this hadith is still valid because all of the Sahaba are trustworthy. So that's a general rule among the scholars. Now you might say, well, how did Aisha heard it? Well, most likely she heard it from the Prophet himself. We don't know if Aisha meant I guess right? to answer my question, I just thought about it. Huh? Why would Khadija narrate while the Prophet outlived her? Okay, sure. Makes sense. And he told it to Aisha, probably? He, yeah, that yeah. most likely it is the Prophet who told it to Aisha, yes. Very, very, I mean, it's almost very clear, yeah. Okay, anyone else over there? What is seclusion? What is what? Seclusion. Khalwa. Oh, seclusion. Seclusion is to go into a place and live there by yourself. With no one else. Sure, welcome. Making notes. All right. Yes, sir. Good job. Anyone else? Any other questions? All good questions, mashallah. Yes. Maybe the last question. Maybe la the last question. Please listen up. Yeah. What is your advice tonight for all the young here for meditation? What is my advice tonight for all the good folks here, the good young folks, as far as meditation? Okay. You you probably noticed in the beginning that we talked a lot about the idea of going outside and taking a look and looking around you. So, I think maybe one of the, I would say, the, the problems or the illnesses of today's uh, life and culture is that we are glued, listen up, we are glued to the screen, like almost all the time. Like even you're trying to sleep and you're still staring at home, and you won't put it down, and then you, you take like two hours just watching YouTube videos and uh, playing games and all of that. So this advice could not have been said at a better time. Like in the old days, you don't have to tell people, they're already looking at nature. Now we have a problem. I mean, and that causes all kinds of psych psychological problems. The fact that we are glued to those uh, uh, artificial objects. These are not real objects. They're man-made. They're not God-made. They're man-made. So the number one advice is that take a break from that phone. Put it at a place where you cannot reach it. You go, you go to sleep at night, don't put it next to you. Don't say, I'm going to use the alarm. Buy an actual alarm. Like, I don't know if you recognize those anymore. Like, when he, no one had a phone, how do you think people used to wake up? Uh, the, the rooster. Rooster, that was too old, not 20 years ago. <laughs> Hey, you can buy a rooster too. I'm not against that. You can buy an alarm clock. Those things still exist. You can go to Walmart or someplace. They still have them. Or you can put it far away so it could rain, but it's not next to you. If you have good intention, it will happen. Yeah, yeah, it will happen. And the other advice... The other advice, I know some people say, well, I'm young, I don't have to do this. Train yourself from now. You keep it there, you can get it later. Whoever threw it. Actually, that's a beautiful idea. I used to do that a lot in the past. Before, before any halaqa, what I would say, 
Submit all your weapons, all of your phones. There's an iPhone X in the middle for free. That's just beautiful, look at that. So many people complying. So let's keep them there until the end. Hmm? That's good. So, the second advice, take time, have your busy schedule. I know all of you are busy. I know all of you are very, very busy, but take some time out of your busy schedule and go outside in the backyard. You don't have to be, you know, in some fancy place. You can go to a park or to your backyard and just look around you and make some simple dhikr. You can say, subhanAllah, just walk and you can take five minutes. This is like a break. You're, you're doing homework. You want to take a break? This is the best break you can do. Just go outside and just take it easy, calm down, look around you and say, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah. Be grateful. I mean, when you say alhamdulillah, just feel how lucky you are. Be grateful to all the things you have in your life. I don't want to give you two, other, like, two things uh, you can do, everybody can do. <laughs> Very simple. This is your like primer into meditation. Meditation 101 or, or less. What about the Quran? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, when we say the Quran obviously is, is one. one. Uh, but I'm making it even simpler. I'm saying like, if you don't memorize Quran, I mean, everybody should know SubhanAllah and Alhamdulillah. All right. Quiz. Quiz time.